All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Tim Chown. I work at JISC as the Network Development Manager there. I've been involved with V6 for longer than I care to remember. Um, I am a fairly regular attendee at the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. So I'm here today to give you, where do I point this at? Just to give you a, a little update on what's happening there and what the interesting topics that are happening in the IETF is. So, <coughs> The Internet Engineering Task Force is pretty much the de facto standards body for anything that's sort of IP and transport layer, covers some other bits and pieces as well. Um, it meets in person three times a year. It's completely open, so it's not membership-based and voting-based. Anyone can register and attend. Anyone can take part in the mailing lists that exist. So it's a, it's a nicely open um, community. The most recent meeting was a, a couple of weeks ago uh, in Prague, IETF 118, which um, I was at. Um, you can look at the information about the meeting there and the agenda and the minutes that are, are there already. Some of them still missing, but if you want to get a feel for what happened there, uh, all the information is there. And again, completely open. There's no paywalls or anything. A very, very open community. And the thing that also impressed me was um, there's been a, a growing interest in having a hackathon where people get together and just code new stuff and work together on new ideas. Um, that was the biggest I've ever seen it at the last IETF. There was a room probably four times the size of this, just full of round tables with people there, about 300 people hacking for an attendance of probably just over 1,000 in total. Anyway, I'll try and cover what I think are some of the interesting topics uh, with related to V6 um, in today's talk. So there are sort of two main IPv6-related working groups in the IETF. There's one that's more the standards... Um, oriented track, six man that's um, maintaining the existing protocols, tweaking them where necessary through operational experience, and maybe some new stuff as well. You can look at the, again, it's all open. You can go and look at all the documents that are there, the RFCs that have been published in that working group, the active drafts that have been adopted by the working group, and the personal drafts that have not yet been adopted. So because it's an open thing, Anyone, anyone in this room, could, you could write an internet draft, submit it as a personal draft, and it's into the, uh, the meat grinder of the IETF. Um, but just because you write a draft doesn't mean to say it's going to get adopted. You have to present it on the list, discuss it, and get you know, the working group to agree that, that the idea, or at least the topic you're, you've written the draft about, is a good one, and then to adopt it when a, the draft then gets shaped by the working group, hopefully then through... Um, the working group and out and, and published as an RFC. Um, so I've just put some numbers there just to give you an idea of the sort of current level of activity in terms of the drafts that are, that are going. And then there's V6 Ops, which is more the operations side. So you're not setting standards there. It's more about documenting best practices, writing informational drafts about approaches to deployment, um, that sort of thing, or operational issues that come up. And again, 83 RFCs since that started. Out of a total, we're quite close now. I don't think we've had the RFC 10,000 published yet, but that's the, the number of RFCs the IETF has produced over the, the many years it's existed. And there again, eight active drafts um, and 18 personal um, drafts there. The expired drafts are ones that are older than six months old. So they've been adopted by the working group and then they've kind of faded away. So they, they generally get trimmed after a while. Um, there are some, many other uh, IPv6-related working groups in the IETF. Um, it's important to note that all working groups now should be including IPv6 as a routine thing of what they do. You can't exclude it. And also, there should be no new IPv4-specific work that's been, being started, unless maybe that work is about um, how to turn on um, V6 or V6-related. So three I've mentioned there. DHC, that's the Dynamic Host Configuration Working Group. Uh, DHCP v6 is the main thing they do. There's SNAC, which Tom is going to talk about soon. Um, the Stub Network Auto Configuration uh, is quite amusing. In the previous IETF, that the SNAC working group was directly before the BEER working group. Um, BEER being a multicast technology, bit indexed explicit replication. So um, you can get BEER and SNACs at the ITF, it's true. And then there's six low which is sort of related to the sort of IoT things you'll, you'll hear about as well um, today. So there's a lot going on, um, but what are the, um, you know, the, the hot topics? So I've just picked a few out here. 
Um, there's a few other IETF regulars in the audience who may or may not agree with this list, but I just thought, just give you a flavor of what's going on, the sort of things that are being discussed and tweaked and possibly changing at, the, at some point. So I'll go through these um, one by one. The first one of those is this idea of IPv6 mostly, which Jen is going to be talking about later this afternoon, so I don't want to steal her content or her thunder. But the general principle here is to streamline operations and to emphasize that you know, the sites that are doing dual stack, that's great, but dual stack isn't the end game. The end game is to make things as simple as possible by going v6 only as much as possible. So Jen's going to talk about that and how she's done that at um, Google um, using a DHCP4 option and CLATs on the hosts. Um, so if there's people here that are currently running enterprise networks that have gone dual stack, and I'm looking at you, <laughs> David, from Imperial, um, you know, this is the sort of thing that would probably be of interest to you um, to, to look further forward um, at how you can remove v4 in your network and do it in a, uh, a nice sort of structured and, and friendly way without trying to do it as a big bang. So that's, I think, very interesting, and we'll hear more about that this afternoon. Um, the next one is um, sort of, I wouldn't say it's related, but it's a it's, it's similar type of thinking and forward-looking. Um, maybe not quite as well baked in the IETF yet, but it's, I think it's important to, to tell you about it. And this is the idea of a host being able to get a prefix via DHCP prefix delegation. Obviously, at the moment, things like CPEs get that. You know, your home router may get a prefix from the ISP via PD. Um, but you could also use PD to get a prefix to a host, and there's a, you know, a working group adopted draft on that. Um, that needn't be, in theory, a slash 64, but at the moment, because the prefix is delegated, needs to work with Slack. In practice, it kind of has to be. Um, and one of the drivers for this is if, you've got a, if you're running a large layer 2 network, say a Wi-Fi network, at the moment, hosts on that network can generate an awful lot of addresses, the v6 address, privacy addresses, et cetera, other addresses. Um, and that can put demands on the scalability of the wireless um, controllers. So the controllers will need to handle a lot of more address mappings, MAC mappings, et cetera, and maintain a lot more state. If instead you push prefixes to the hosts, then the host can potentially just use that prefix and generate addresses from that prefix and use those addresses. That might be for itself, or it might be for containers running on the host or hosts that connect through that host. So it's an interesting idea, and I th it's um, one I, I'm quite interested in following myself. Um, there are, I say, alternatives are described in, in another personal draft at the moment. This draft, the PD per device draft, doesn't really talk about the host behavior. It talks about the principle of delegating the prefix to the host. Whereas the draft by Ole Tron there talks about the existing methods that are used to extend a network through a host, of which this can be one. So it sort of complements rather than maybe alternative. And so it talks about, for example, Chromos um, uses Slack and neighbor discovery proxying to give addresses to um, hosts running within uh, the Chromos device, for example. So I think this is a very interesting idea. I think, obviously, if more hosts within an enterprise are getting PD prefixes that are slash 64s, maybe there's a bit of pressure on the address space there. Um, but I think there's a lot to like um, about this, and I think it's something that's going to go forward in the ITF and something to follow and, and see how it goes. Um, sort of coupled to that then, and this one keeps coming back, sort of like, um, you know, the plot in East Enders keeps repeating. This one does come back. At the moment, you know, Slack basically means that host subnets are slash 64. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about, well, isn't that an awful lot of the a waste for the 128-bit address space that you're never going to have two to the 64 hosts in a subnet? Um, there's an RFC that I've, I've got my name on, am amongst other authors, that explains why the slash 64 is the way it is and the issues that would happen if you did change it. But things like DHCP v6 and the DHCP PD uh, idea I just mentioned does raise the question of whether host subnets could be longer than slash 64. Do, do they have to be fixed that way? So it's possible, and some people have presented ideas about how we could introduce new standards and tackle this, you know, wrestle this eel, if you like, in the IETF about adding the potential for prefixes to be longer than that's 64. Maybe variable completely, maybe 
slash 80. There are different approaches you could take, and it's a very you know, contentious thing, this. And then there's the whole issue of how you transition to a new variable length, and there's a whole lot of debate. Um, I think at the moment, the, the great thing about Slack, and even though you might think it's wasteful, is that at least Slack ensures every network gets at least a slash 64. You can do little tricks with the v 6 and you can run prefix lengths that are longer, but it's, there are issues if you do that that the Y64 RFC describes. So I think that the thing here is to just to bear in mind that you know, we assume slash 64 for host and subnets at the moment, but there may be work that emerges in the IETF that changes that, and some of that may be driven by the PD to the host thing as well. So it's an interesting topic and something worth following. Um, DHPv6. I think Jeffrey mentioned at the start that you know, the Slack is a, a big benefit for, for V6, but DHCP V6 is also still important. And one of the things that's happening is um, the DHCP V6 standard, the RFC, that's being updated and then going to be republished as a new RFC that becomes an internet standard. There are actually very few internet standards out of all the RFCs. What that means is that that protocol is widely deployed, proven to be robust, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It, it, it's an indication of the maturity of that protocol. So the DHC working group, maybe it'll close after this is published. I'm sure there'll be more things that come for DHC. But at the moment, that's its focus: is to republish this as an internet standard. They're, so they're going through the existing RFC, tidying it up, clarifying things that have maybe changed a bit since that was published, obsoleting some of the DHCPv6 options, etc. Uh, etc. Et and it's a similar thinking to RFC 8200, some of you may be familiar with, which is the core IPv6 standard. That was um, republished um, back in 2017 just to indicate that IPv6 is now mature, it is widely deployed, it is a true internet standard rather than just a, a proposed standard. Um, another topic that comes up quite a lot when you speak to people that manage enterprise networks is you know, how do I get accountability for which devices have which addresses, especially with things like privacy addresses and Slack devices generating their own addresses rather than being assigned addresses via DHCP? Um, there are approaches you can do to get that accountability. You can scrape your switches and routers or poll them for the ND mappings. Some switch routers support syslogging of ND activity, so you can gather the information you need to get some accountability. If you're on Wi-Fi, maybe if you're at one of the universities, you'll have EduRome that uses Edu2.1x, which has accountability. But the idea here with this draft is that, and it's again, it's working group adopted and it is moving forward, is that a host could send a message to a DHCP v6 server saying, hey, I've just generated this address and I'm using it. So you have some accountability there. Of course, if you're a, a, a bad actor on a network, you will probably turn that option off. But for a general network operator uh, in an enterprise network who wants a little bit more accountability and mapping information for troubleshooting, et cetera, this could be a very nice option. So that's currently going through and close to working group last call, maybe, I think. Um, there's another, uh, another RFC I have my name on. This is the address selection RFC. When hosts want to send uh, a message, they'll have a set of candidate source and destination addresses, and you need ways of going through and selecting actually which pair you're going to use. So there is a little um, issue, if you like, at the moment with RFC 6724, is that it will prefer to talk V6 Global to V6 Global over V4 to V4 to get preference for, for use of V6. But at the moment, um, V4 to V4 is preferred over ULA to ULA. So if you're deploying ULA in an enterprise network, for example, um, it may be counterintuitive that if your hosts also have maybe private V4 addressing, they'll still continue to use V4. And if you're trying to get rid of the use of V4, that's uh, not ideal. Um, so there's a, a proposal for this 6724 update that we change the policy table so that ULA to ULA would by default be preferred over any V4 to V4. So that's... There's some discussion about that, and it's not universally, uh, there's no universal consensus on that yet, but it's being discussed and, and, and progressed. And then the final thing I've got, um, IPv6 extension headers, we all know and, and, and love them. Um, so one of the original ideas with v6, of course, was to streamline the base header 
And then additional functions are implemented through extension headers like fragmentation, IPSEC, et cetera. Um, but one of the things that has emerged over years of operational practice is that um, extension headers might be filtered in the network quite often at a destination network at a firewall where the firewall maybe not, maybe not trust what those extension headers are, um, may drop packets, uh, have another RFC that published the, um, the experimental evidence of the, the percentages of drops, and it's not insignificant. So there's a couple of um, drafts going through at the moment, again, both adopted by six man, so they'll probably go through in some form or another and get published. One on sort of the minimum expectations for processing if you're a, uh, a node or router forwarding um, packets with EHs, uh, extension headers in, as to what you should forward, and even forwarding extension headers you don't recognize as being the recommended behavior. And then there's another draft on what the limit should be. That's a little bit more contentious. The, the idea of making sure more packets get through by setting a, a minimum of what you, you do is, is quite well accepted. The, the maximum limits is more contentious than the ITF. So for example, the proposal is that you would um, forward packets with up to 128 bytes, uh, sorry, 104 bytes of extension header chain because you can assume maybe the forwarding device has 128 byte parsing buffer. Um, so that's being discussed again at the moment. And I think it's important, um, you know, if we want to do more things with extension headers, that there is more robustness in the way that they're treated. Um, Okay, so those were the things I thought you might be interested in hearing about. I think the thing to emphasize there is what I said with RFC 8200, the core IPv6 specification is stable, robust, and widely implemented. What we're talking about here, are, you know, the ideas, the sort of thing Jeffrey was mentioning, the sort of innovation and new things you can do because you've got v6. Okay, thank you. Take any questions.